All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, of course, when I have a lot of content is when every piece of technology decides to fail. Um, but I haven't got my notebook up yet, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, all right, so today we're gonna talk about linear regression and least squares. But before we do that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the final exam. Um, and apologies to whoever made the Piazza post, but uh, I, uh, I'm not always sure how I want to do it until I actually present it. So the plan for the final exam is it's 3 to 5 p.m. currently in this room on the 11th. Um, I'm trying very hard to get it to be in not this room, um, but it's I, I, I have no control over it. We'll see what happens. Um, but the way it'll work is uh, there will be a written portion as well as a Jupyter Notebook portion. So make sure you set up the Jupyter Notebook in advance. Um, and basically you'll kind of, uh, actually let me go to the next slide. But before that, project two is due tomorrow. Um, you should have seen Piazza posts about demo day and the course assistant stuff. So you don't need this anymore if you want to apply for that. <coughs> uh, yeah, all right, moving on. So the exam's in two parts. Um, I haven't quite decided which part's gonna be first. So it may, I may reverse that order, I haven't decided yet. But there'll be a written component, which um, basically, you know, bring a writing utensil um, and it'll be closed book, okay? Then there'll be a Jupyter Notebook part, which is basically open whatever, okay? Um, so, yeah, uh, but it'll cover the whole semester with a focus on since the midterm. Um, do you have a question? So we don't have one currently. I actually made it a project last semester and so that's where that one came from. Um, so uh, we don't have one for the full semester, just the first half. Um, I, I had thought about doing it for this semester, but I was going to do it. Maybe I'll do it next semester. So we'll see what happens. Um, however, uh, actually, I'll get to that in a second. So any other questions at the moment? Okay. Uh, let me just check and see if my notebook is up yet. Yeah, this is really ill today. All right. Um, okay, so if you have a conflict, which can occur, right, where you have another final exam or something like that uh, with this time slot, uh, please let us know by next Thursday's lecture. The other thing is, as I said for the midterm, um, if you have documented accommodation requirements, uh, please also let us know by next Thursday. That way we can try to do something about it. Um, however, if you have a request for an accommodation that is not in the narrowly focused uh, official list of accommodations, also let us know by next Thursday and we'll see if we can do anything about it. Okay, I'm not making any promises, but we might be able to do something to make life simpler um, without having to write whole new tests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the easiest way, and I think what we should do probably going forward is, I'm just gonna take my email address off of the syllabus and stuff, but if you do a private Piazza post, that way it doesn't, uh, make sure it doesn't get lost. Uh, so you can do a private to the instructors only, uh, and that way Graham or I can respond to your request. You know, send an email if you want to, but I make less promises on my responsiveness on email. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Uh, and so here is a rough idea of the exam content. Uh, don't forget the slides will go up after the end of class, so you'll be able to get it uh, this later. Um, just when it says future lecture here, right? So we have, you know, a couple more lectures before the end of the semester. Um, so even though I haven't covered these yet, we will cover them uh, and they will be on the final exam, okay? Make sense to everybody? All right. All right, uh, and just to give you a sense of what the Jupyter Notebook portion would be like, um, so here are some examples. So like in homework nine, calculating the number of warp planes that uh, Germany has. Um, although, wait, we're not up to homework nine yet, are we? <laughs> All right, so, so it'll be a surprise for later. It's about German warplanes. Um, and then uh, how likely is it that there's a trash can near a blue bike dock? Um, so we have two pieces of data coming from the city. 
where the blue bikes can dock and where uh, the trash cans in the city are. So maybe we could figure out how likely there is to be a trash can nearby. Um, you may, you've probably seen them, they're called the big bellies, um, but they actually get listed because they actually phone home when they're full. Um, they're kind of neat. Uh, does anyone know here what 311 is? Raise your hand if you know what 311 is. Uh, wow, all right. Uh, you would think this would be like an intro to, to BU, but uh, 311 is both an application and like you can tweet at them and stuff too. Uh, but if you want to report anything like uh, you see a needle on the ground, a street light is out, uh, you know, trash pickup didn't come, uh, you can post it to 311. It's similar to 911, except it's not for emergencies, it's for like just general city stuff. Uh, if you don't have it, I highly recommend it. It's very handy, um, but it has uh, the data. You can do pro private or public uh, posts and the public ones are also publicly available. So they're another data set I sometimes play with. Yeah. Will there be a practice plan for you? Uh, no, not really. Um, so there's, uh, I, I haven't taught the class long enough to have a, a bunch of old exams. Um, so, but we'll get to that in a second too. Um, and then another one is which Boston neighborhood has the most construction, another public data set where you get uh, permits to do construction. Uh, and so that would be another example. Um, if you're interested in any of this stuff or you wanna look into it more, uh, check out data.boston.gov. Uh, and there's a ton of different data sets there all about the city. All right, so to your point, how to study. Uh, so the midterm review guide is useful. Um, However, we need, there is a bug fix we need to make uh, to it um, and, uh, and update it. Uh, you know, whatever notes you have taken, hopefully you've taken some. Uh, there is also the playlist. That URL looks wrong. Um, so I didn't think it was a bit.ly link. Um, so I'll check that uh, and make sure, but I think I posted a Piazza post about the playlist already. So it basically has every lecture recorded unless there was some technical error. Um, I think I'm about four lectures behind, but they should be, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be going faster as we get towards the end of the semester. So you have them to review. Um, and then the lecture notebooks. Uh, so most of those, I think I'm two lectures behind on that or so. Uh, but for the most part, they are in the material slash lecture number uh, directory where you got the original class version. Make sense? Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have Jupiter working yet? Oh, looking, looking like I'm getting progress. All right. So talking about the correlation cove. Oh, sorry. It won't be writing code. Some of it's multiple choice. Some of it's like short answer. There's no like essay, um, but the whole, it's too hard to write code on paper. So all the code stuff is in Jupyter Notebook pretty much, not entirely. So I may ask something like, what function do you use to, uh, you know, I always, I have a hard time looking for a different word, but use to apply a method to a whole table, right? So I might say something like that, where you have to say, here's this function, um, but I won't say, you know, write a sampling algorithm and, you know, and, you know, do some sort of prediction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you should just kind of keep in mind, right, to do study the kind of methods and stuff we've been using all the time because they will or may appear. Um, they're not, you know, don't just rely on the open book portion for that. It's just I won't actually ask you to write real code, just answer some individual question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I want to say it's like 60, 40 Jupyter Notebook. So, so 60 percent for the Jupyter Notebook, 40 yeah, for the yeah, if I recall correctly, it's in that neighborhood. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you for raising the question about the coding. Uh, I should really put that on the slide um, because that's a handy piece of information. All right, so correlation coefficient. Um, so we talked about this last time. So we refer to it as R normally. Um, 
And this is how you calculate it. So you take y in standard units and then x in standard units, then the product of the standard deviation of x and y, uh, and then the average of the product of the standard x, standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. Um, and basically, you know, it ranges from negative one to one, uh, and you know, a, a positive correlation is closer to one, a negative correlation, sorry, positive association is closer to one, and a negative association is closer to negative one. Um, negative just being that it goes down, not necessarily that it's bad or less correlated. And we have some questions. All right. So if X and Y have a correlation of one, then one must cause the other. Is that true or false? All right, get those answers in. See if my notebook is loading. All right, I'm gonna close it. And most of you got it. Uh, so a correlation does not require a causal impact, right? So just because two things go up together does not mean uh, that one causes the other, okay? Um, you know, me eating a lot, well, no, that's not a good example. Um, I, don't know, I can't think of a good example. All right, so sorry, moving on. Um, all right, another correlation question. If the correlation of X and Y is close to zero, then knowing one will never help us predict the other. All right, make sure you read the question closely. Oops. Back here. Apologies. All right, get the answers in. And I'm gonna close it now. All right, very split, that's not a good sign. So all it tells you is that there's not a linear association, okay? There may still be an association, remember? So if it's a nonlinear association, you might get a correlation of zero, okay? So the answer here is false. Um, and I think we'll get to an example of it uh, in this lecture. All right, another question someday. All right, so if X and Y have a correlation of negative 0 0.8, then they have a negative association. All right, get those answers in. All right, closing it. Well, I think everybody got it in that time. All right, the correct answer was true. So a negative association just means it angles down, right? You know, as uh, one, as basically as the Y, yeah, the Y and the X, uh, as the X kind of gets bigger, the Y gets lower.
All right. Um, okay, so prediction. So some examples, right? Um, a lot of times it's difficult to know one piece of information, but we might know another piece of information that lets us uh, be able to try to figure out the, the first thing. So weirdly enough, the number of hospital beds in any, at any given time, right, is actually a little bit hard to predict. Um, so one of the things that they use is air pollution by, to indicate how many of those hospital, oh, sorry, free hospital beds, sorry. Um, air pollution can often be an indicator because if the air pollution is high, there's more people who are being seen in hospitals and stuff for like asthma or breathing related issues or whatever. So kind of a weird relationship. Um, but another one that's super weird is predicting house prices by using house size. Now that actually doesn't sound like they would correlate all that well if you think of a place like Boston, right? Where a house, you know, a very small house here um, is gonna cost a lot more money than a much bigger house somewhere out in the suburbs, right? Uh, so these can be a little bit difficult to do predictions, but they're the kind of thing that you want to be able to solve for. So you gotta figure out how can you build those kinds of relationships. Um, and then another just example, um, and I don't think I talked about this already, but um, maybe I did. Uh, so the number of app users using it by, uh, to try to predict the number of users in an application based on the number of application downloads. That seems logical, but it may not be, right? Because um, just because somebody downloaded an app doesn't mean they're still using it, right? Maybe they downloaded it, tried it, uh, tr tried it, uh, and then decided it was not for them, and so they just moved on. So <laughs> you gotta be careful with making sure that you understand what the confounding factors are, uh, you know, or where those relationships really are. And so uh, using correlation, that kind of stuff can start to give us some hints about what those might be. All right, so the first thing we talked about for trying to do prediction was the nearest neighbor regression, okay? And so basically what we do is we say, okay, we're gonna take a slice of the data, then we're gonna average out what the result is, and then we're gonna use that as a prediction for, um, uh, you know, future data, basically. Um, so this is a relatively simplistic method, um, and so we're also gonna talk about, or we did a little bit talk about linear regression, uh, which tries to build a line so that you can uh, do the same kind of thing, except a little bit better. Um, so does anybody have any ideas about how a nearest neighbor model could be improved? What could you do differently that might make you give you better averages? Any ideas? So any rough ideas about how you could take, because remember we're taking a slice and then we're kind of taking the average in the middle, right? Um, and we're using that to predict future cases of X, right? Potentially, there's, a, there's the one I'm looking for though is better than that. All right, well, we'll talk about it more later. Oh, go ahead. So we're gonna talk about the linear regression, but this is, uh, I think, more similar to nearest neighbor. So that is definitely a good thing, and that definitely helps. It really just makes the math simpler though, not necessarily the quality of the result better. Okay, so we haven't talked about this, to be clear. That's why I'm bringing it up. All right, so, uh, and hopefully, I'm hoping we'll get to it before the end of the semester, um, but there's another method, method that uses what's called clustering. So instead of just doing a slice, what if we just looked at all the stuff around, say the mid-parent height, right, in that particular region, and then try to use that to predict it rather than the full slice. And maybe we'll get a better result because we know more about around it than we do the whole slice, if that makes sense. So hopefully we'll talk about it more. Um, and, uh, but as you can see, right, there's lots and lots of ways to improve these mechanisms. Um, and, you know, some of them have been discovered, but some have not. And so there's lots of different algorithms we can use. And some, some of them work better in some cases and some work better in other cases. 
So keeping in mind which ones work well at what is important. All right, so nearest neighbor regression. Um, this is really used here as kind of an, almost as an introduction to the linear regression. And yeah, let's move on. Oh, a question. Oh, wait, did I do that right? Yeah, sorry. Uh, what do you group in nearest neighbor regression? All right, get those answers in. All right, I'm calling it. So pretty good. All right, so as I was kind of drawing my picture, right, you're, you're grouping nearby X values, right? Otherwise I would be drawing it like this or something. Um, and so that's how you make predictions about why, but you do it by grouping together the X's. All right, so let's talk about linear regression. And, oops, why is everything so weird today? Okay, so linear regression. So basically, we always do it in standard units, okay? And we're describing the deviation of x from 0, or the average of x's, and the deviation of y from 0, the average of the y's. And on average, y deviates from 0 less than x deviates from 0. And so this is the, uh, walls, uh, the function that we use to calculate the thing we care about, which is y. Okay? So in other words, when I have those mid-parent heights going across the bottom, right? what I want to do is try to predict what the child height will be, which is up on the y-axis, right? So we use the y in standard units, and that's equal to our correlation coefficient times x, okay? Also in standard units. And that's how we calculate it. Um, and I think we build it. Oh, yeah. So... Forgot that was a build slide, otherwise it would have been, I wouldn't have had to point it out. Um, so, but this is our regression line, or so in a linear regression, we end up with a regression line, uh, and this is the calculation for it. All right. So in original units, the regression line has this equation. So if you use the original values, though before you convert it to standard units, this is what it really looks like, right? So this is all broken down before you do that conversion. Um, however, you know, obviously that's a lot of complexity. So what we do is convert all, the whole thing to standard units first. Then we do this, uh, you know, we do kind of the prior line method. But if you notice, a line can be expressed by the slope and the intercept, okay? So if we know what the slope is, and we know what the x is, right? And we know what the intercept is, we can calculate the y. So the slope is basically the angle, right, of the slope. Okay, and the intercept is where the line crosses zero. Okay, so the intercept in this case, right, is going to be at zero, but it won't necessarily be at zero, but it's like where, um, yeah, where, where it crosses the, oh, I think I'm saying it wrong, but the, it's where it crosses zero. Yeah, that's right. Some days my brain doesn't work that well. Um, so this tells us a few things um, that we can kind of break it down so we can actually get to a much simpler formula, right? So if we can figure out this stuff, then we can just get down to just the slope and the intercept, and now we can calculate it much more easily. Okay. And then this is kind of the um, 
kind of if you talk about it in terms of what are we trying to do, well, what we're trying to get right at the end of the day is an estimate of why. We want to know what the child's height is predicted to be. And what we have is what we observe, right, which is mid-parent height. And so another kind of just a graphical representation of the same idea, right, is that when we're, we're looking at it, right, we have the x over here, and then we can kind of say this is where our estimated value is. And then we have, but when we have an intercept here, it crosses zero, right? So this is how we can calculate that, you know, basically what we want to get the y from. I still don't like how these slides work. I take it back. I rearranged them, tried to make them better. Still need progress. Or still need work. Um, let me just run these. And so as we did last time, I think, or maybe two times ago, we have a function that will convert something to standard units, right, when you pass it in, uh, and then we'll also calculate the correlation, so we have those two methods. But now what we want to do is also create something that will calculate the slope and the intercept. So, um, couldn't figure out where to put question marks in for this one, um, but we know to get the R, we go we want to do the correlation function that we have above, and we're going to pass it our table, our x, and our y, so that it can calculate the correlation and get us that r. Then we need the standard deviation for y, which would be np standard t dot column. Of y. And then we need to do the same thing with the X, except I need to type it correctly. Nope. So we do NP standard of T dot column X. And then to calculate the intercept, which actually, let me throw this part in here because I think it, I shouldn't have taken this out because I think it helps. Um, but so for the slope, the mathematical formula is this, right? And so, oh, we forgot the important line here. How about a return? And now we know all the pieces, right? So we can say R times y underscore sd divided by x underscore sd. And then the intercept, let me throw that formula up there. Right, which is the mean of y minus the slope times the mean of x. And so we know how to calculate that pretty well by just saying the mean of x equals np dot mean t dot column of x. And then mean underscore y is going to be the np mean of t dot column y. Right? And then our return value is just the result. Y minus slope of t x and y times the mean of x. So on your on your cheat sheet for you know things like final exams and stuff, this would be handy, right? Because it's going to come in really handy whenever you need linear regression. So we have a function to calculate the slope and a function to calculate the intercept. And assuming I typed everything correctly, um, we can see an example. So as you remember, my little method here, this r underscore table, will generate a table that has an r coefficient of 0.5, which is like 
here-ish, right? But so if we see the slope, it comes out to be pretty close, right? Um, Python is, well, we have some, because this is some randomness in here, right? And then this is probably also related to Python rounding and stuff, that it's not a perfect score. Like it's not perfectly 0 0.5. All right. So going back to the Galton height data. So here's our heights. And then we have, wait, let me just see. I feel like I was supposed to put something in there. Okay, so this is our heights with predictions using uh, nearest neighbor. And we're gonna add that as a column to our initial table. So now we have the predictions, oops. And I hate when I don't print tables. Predictions. All right, still cooking. Okay, so here's, we did this, I think last time. So this is the midterm height, and then here is the actual child's average height, and then this is our prediction using the nearest neighbor. And so we just kind of shove all that in the table. But now we can get from our data here, right? This is the way we can do the linear version of it. Um, and we can actually get the slope from the heights, okay, using our slope function above, all right, and the intercept using our intercept function above. So we do the same calculation we were talking about before, but now we know a slope and an intercept. And so we're gonna just kind of take one quasi at random from the table, okay? So this is our original heights table. We're gonna pull out row 123 for no particular reason, except that the rest of my example uses that, okay? Um, and so we know that the mid-parent height is 69.48. And we have Using the nearest neighbor, we had a bunch of people where the mid-parent height, right, was 69.48. Then we have a bunch of different, you know, children and their various heights. And then here's our nearest neighbor prediction of 66 or nearly 67 inches uh, for the children. But so let's look at what we could do to get the regression, uh, uh, linear regression. And... So does anyone remember what we should put here? All right, here, we'll uh, maybe make it easier. So we know that this is how we get the linear regression, right? So, hold on one sec. All right, any ideas what we should put in there? All right, go ahead. It's the actual slope. So Not it's the actual slope. Yep. Multiplier by midterm and average height from round to the percentile. Yep. And looks like I spelled heights wrong. Mid pair, and then we add, oops, add the Galton intercept that we previously calculated. Intercept. And now we should have a new table that has both kinds of predictions. So this is using the average nearest neighbor prediction, and then this is our uh, linear regression prediction. And you can see they're slightly different, which kind of makes sense. And 
what we can do is try to look at, yeah, I thought this was gonna, Okay, so now we can see, hey, look, we have our actual data, right, which is the blue dots, or these darker blue dots. Then we have our uh, nearest neighbor prediction, which is the yellow dots. And then we have our regression prediction. Notice it's still not a line, right, because we're only sampling for individual x's, right? There isn't, a, there isn't necessarily a mid parent right here. And that's why it's not showing up as a line. We could draw a line, but that's we're doing the actual prediction. Okay, and so those, they're all, they're pretty close, right? Um, however, the linear regression is certainly easier to calculate. And from there, we'll go back over here. Whoops. And before we kind of move on to the next thing, so, um, if we use a linear regression to predict candy prices in dollars from sugar content in grams, what are the units of each of the following? Okay. So what would the units be of R? What's our correlation coefficients units? Is it, you know, what are the things listed here? Or is it something else or? All right, I kept harping on it. You know? Nope. What I keep harping on, you have to calculate. Or convert. Right on. So, uh, therefore, the correlation coefficient is in standard units. Okay. And that's important to remember, right? Because when you use that R, if you use it with non standard units, it's gonna be really wrong, right? Um, okay, and so what's the slope in terms of? Dollars per gram is correct. What about the intercept? Anybody know what the intercept is in? Anybody else? Uh, correct, yes. I always like to check my cheat sheet, make sure I don't say something stupid. Uh, sometimes I forget to write a good enough cheat sheet though. Um, so yeah, so it's important to remember what the units are of the thing you're playing with, right? Because otherwise you can really make some broken math um, just because you decided to mix up, you know, grams and dollars, right? Okay, so we have our linear regression. Now what do we want to do? We want to make see how good it is right so we want to get an idea of its error rate um, and we use a method called least squares it's usually called um, and so our error in estimation is as you might imagine right the error is equal to the actual value minus the estimate some errors are positive and some negative and so you measure the rough size of the errors then you square the errors to get rid of the cancellation factor, right? Because some of them are negative and some are positive. And if you try to merge them, right, they're gonna get closer to zero than they should be. Um, and so then take the average of the squared errors, okay? And then the square root to go back to your kind of original units, right? Because you squared them, so now you take the square root. And then that results in what's called the root mean square error, okay? but it's usually shortened to RMSE, okay? So this is what we mean when we say least squares. It's the root mean square error. And I'm not sure why it's all of a sudden in favor of Democrats, but apparently the slide upload was not pretty. Okay, so. I remember the, where the question marks are. Um, so, so right here, we need the calculation to get to our um, our line, basically, and so we do the slope 
times, in this case, X limbs plus our intercept. Okay. Um, and what I want to point out here, uh, I forgot a comma. And then down here, we're also going to plot that line so that we can see what it looks like. Um, slope times X. I probably should have just left this one here. Okay, and just make sure it's right. Okay, so what we're doing here, let me point out a couple of things. So this sample here, I just picked random points, okay, to kind of be able to show this spot, this spot, and this spot in the data, okay, when in our graph that I'll show in a minute. Then what it's going to do is it's actually going to print the scatter plot, okay, of this college percentage, okay, versus median income. Um, and then it's going to make this X limbs array, which is going to plot a line with the slope um, and the intercept we chose. And then it's going to plot a red line from that slope, right, up to these dots. Okay. So it'll make more sense once I display one, but I wanted to explain it a little bit first. And we also make this function called fitted values. Okay. So does anybody know what we mean by a fitted value? All right, so that's our predictions, okay? And the reason it's called that is, um, actually, I don't really know like the kind of word origin, but it's like, it's, it's how it fits, okay? And you'll often hear phrases like overfitting and underfitting, when that means that it's like your, your mechanism to do your predictions can be overfit, which means that it um, doesn't tolerate variability very well. It just kind of always gives the, the same answer. So imagine if the child height was always predicted to be 60 inches, okay, that would be overfitted, right? Whereas underfitted means it's just wildly variable, right? It just kind of goes all over the place. So the fit is, oh, that's kind of what it means. It's like the fit is like how well does this thing this mechanism, whatever you're using, fit on making predictions. Does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. So I make a method called fitted values, which will calculate the fitted value. Um, and then we're going to read this demographics data, which I don't know if we've talked about this before um, or not, but you know, it's just uh, demographics that's got by state and then a congressional district. We've talked about districts before. It's basically a, the smallest unit of government in the U.S. Okay, um, and the median income in this district is forty-seven thousand dollars, and this is the percent that voted for Clinton in um, what twenty sixteen? Is that right? Sixteen? Yeah. Um, and then the percent of uh, people who graduated from college. Okay, so look back. So. We're just going to pull out of the median income and college percentage um, because that's what we're going to do some predictions about. So the first thing we do is look at a scatter plot and we see, right, as you probably might expect, is that the more college for a given area, the higher the median income. Any idea why that would be? Any other ideas? It appears to be, yes. Um, so basically, this is the outcome, right, of a bunch of people making more money, right? So if they have a higher college percentage, then it's likely that more people make more money, and so therefore the overall median income is going to go up. Yeah. What's the, the number of people who graduate, or the percentage of people who graduated from college, like with a bachelor's? who live in that area, obviously. Um, all right. So we can actually find out what the correlation is directly, right? And as you probably can tell from the graph, it's, point, it's about 0.82. 
Um, and then we can calculate our slope and our intercept. And it gives us a slope of 1270, right? And our intercept at 20,802. And then we can start to make some predictions using our fitted values function. We'll drop that into our table and then display a scatter plot. And so now we see, you know, we kind of could imagine the line is there, right? But we're only going to show the parts where it actually matters. Um, but you can see there's a pretty distinct line going up. And it has a slope of about 0.8. All right. So now, now we want to get to the errors, right? So what's, what, uh, what do we do to get to the error? Exactly. So the actual minus minus even the predicted. So that gives us our errors. And then we're going to throw it in the table. But I'm going to print. Oh, no, this is going to print. Never mind. And so now we see, right, the difference between our linear prediction and the actual values. Right, right, right. No, this is the actual value. Um, and so this one was off by uh, right around 4,000. This was off about 6,000. So that tells us a little bit more about the errors, but we want to kind of roll that up into like a simpler number. Um, and so first thing we might take a look at is what's the mean of errors, okay? And you know, notice the e to the minus 13 here. Um, so, right, the problem is, like, what do you think is happening with that average? Why is it so close to zero? Right, so it comes down to zero because our errors are kind of well distributed on either side of the line, right? So when you average them directly, you end up with near zero, right? And notice that e to the minus 13, right? So it's like 13 or 12 zeros in front of that six. Uh, uh, but to the left of the decimal, or right of the decimal, sorry. Um, so, whoops. What we're going to do is we are going to square it to get rid of that problem by just taking our errors and squaring them. And then, right, to get back to the old units, we're going to then take the square root of the result. So that looks a lot more reasonable, right? So the average being around 94 or 9,400 seems more like what we were thinking, right? Not, not near zero. All right. And then, and then we go to the function that I talked about earlier. I've got to remember to set these to disable the scrolling. So now that we can calculate our error, we can see, so this is basically the distance, this red line is the distance between our arbitrarily chosen um, college percentage and the predicted value versus the real value for the median income, right? So, you know, the few we have are, are pretty, you know, like they're pretty distinct, um, but it's still a pretty good prediction. But now, let's see. But we can also experiment with it, right? So we can say, okay, what if we just try some other slopes and intercepts and get some slightly different lines? You know, do our errors improve? And so we can kind of see that visually there, right? But we can also, I think this one comes out really bad. Yeah, so we can, we can also do a terrible job of our, of our guessing um, and end up with very, very bad errors. Um, and now though, we'll go back to the slides. 
Oh, you're on time. Okay. And we have a question. If I can find my mouse. So how do you calculate the error? All right, get those answers in. So this one is a little bit of a trick question because both of them theoretically are correct, okay? You will get an error differential in either scenario. The thing is, when you're doing these kinds of, uh, I don't know, I hesitate to say problems, but when you're trying to, when you're trying to solve these kinds of things, Consistency is key, okay? So kind of talking about like the units thing, right? It's really easy to get out of whack if you lose track of what units are where, right? If you start reversing things or, or being willy nilly about which way you go, then you will, like at least I, maybe you're all perfect, I don't know, uh, will definitely make a mistake sooner or later. So the key is consistency. Um, and so, and then somebody else reviewing your work will also expect the same consistency, okay? So that's why one answer is correct, even though arguably either one is correct. Um, mostly uh, to kind of draw out the difference. Um, we kind of talked about that in some other lecture, I don't remember those, but like the absolute value will give you the same kind of data. Um, but if we can, if we can ex like kind of ex like, like I said, it's almost like stretch out the error by using the square. <coughs> it'll, it'll show us more differences if we're looking at the actual error. Yeah, like more pronounced. Again, that's another thing where like kind of like consistency is key. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that we're, we're doing by practice because they're the way everybody else does it. You know, it's kind of like we were talking about the p-value, uh, specifically the, the person who first wrote about it said, let's say a p-value should be, you know, 0.5, right? Um, and, but that just kind of caught on. So that's what everybody uses. But there's not actually a reason for it. But the same idea is like, as long as, if we try to be consistent, not only will we not make mistakes, but on top of that, if somebody else is looking at whatever you did, they also will be able to in, kind of like intuitively understand it rather than have to figure it out. Uh, okay, so um, the other, uh, yeah, the other last thing I would say is that some of these techniques also, when you're building on them, like in much higher level mathematics, um, they rely on certain features of things like doing this, uh, the square of it rather than just doing the absolute value. Um, and so if you, if you're, if we're kind of building up a base of knowledge, we don't want to start with kind of doing it a different way than, you know, some of the higher level mathematics rely on them to work. Uh, okay, so numerical optimization. So this is a very fancy term for uh, trying to get the right, uh, the right line. Okay. And so what we can do is when I was just trying arbitrary numbers, right? When in the last thing I just showed you, uh, here, maybe, oops. So I'm just kind of trying out arbitrary numbers, right? But what are computers really good at? Uh, ch -ch -ch. Computers are really good at trying the same thing over and over and over again, right? So what we can do is we can actually, because we know what we want, we want as, this to be as small as possible, right? We want this RMSE to be as small as possible. So why not just try every intercept and slope to figure out what the best line is? That makes sense? And this is actually why it's called regression, 
is because you kind of are trying it over and over and over again. Okay. Um, so, so there is a method we can use called minimize, which will basically uh, like try every combination until it gives you uh, it's, uh, I think it's oh yeah slope and intercept. Right, so that's super handy because now you don't have to try to figure out what the slope and intercept should be. You just feed it to minimize, and bang, there you go. Um, what else do I want to talk about on this slide? Um, oh, and sorry, and so kind of that formal definition of, of kind of doing that is numerical minimization. Um, Yeah, and now we'll just kind of demo it. Hopefully it's a good demo. Just catch up here. Wait, did we? Oh yeah, I scrolled up. So, wait, why? Oh, no, I, I think I must have copied this block over twice. Okay, um, so numerical optimization. So, no, this is, this was not a good question here. Okay, so here we have a curve, right? So we're gonna have a hard time with something like linear regression, right? So, however, we can still, this is a, uh, like we can still uh, write a function for a line, even if it's not a straight line, right? So in this case, you know, in, as you get into kind of doing more math or whatever, you can start to figure out what kind, like they're generally standard form when they look a certain way. Um, but so we can calculate that this um, line function is this function here. And so x minus two squared plus three, if you give it an x, okay, so if I give it a two, and then I say two minus two, which is zero, square that, which is still zero, add three, that tells us where this point will be, right? And it is this three. Does that make sense? All right, so you feed in the X, whatever you are on this, you know, going uh, side to side, and it will tell you where the line is up there. So now, let me see if this is, and then we can kind of minimize to get our uh, simplest form. Wait, where's the? Why didn't this give me two numbers? But so if I can give the uh, minimize function a mechanism to calculate the y values, it can figure out what the slope intercept combination are. But I feel like it's supposed to give me, it's not supposed to give me an array value. So I may have to touch that next time we come back because I don't know why it's not giving me two values. But, and what's kind of cool, right? As long as we can write that complicated function in this case to figure out, to draw the line, we can start to make predictions about data. In other words, if we have data that instead of like our nice football cloud, right? Instead of our X's and Y's, that's our, our, our initial data, the stuff we know, looked like this, we can write a function that will draw a line through it. And then we can start to calculate predictions based on it because now we have a line, make sense? or a curve, technically. 
but I'm not, like I said, I'm not sure why it's not gonna be two values. Um, so I'll check into that and bring it back for the next lecture. Um, Oh, right. Yeah, maybe that's why. But I don't know, it's still be giving that, like, you don't change your return values. Yeah, that's the minimum value that you put in to give you the smallest order. That's that fixed. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, I'll look it up. I can't remember why it's, why it's breaking my brain. Um, okay, so, um, so we can minimize, I, I, maybe it's just not a great example. So, but we can minimize the root mean squared error. Or maybe that's why I got confused because I jumped. Nope. Uh, I'll fix that next time. Um, but basically what we want to do is kind of minimize all those errors, right? And we can end up with what's often referred to as a best fit line or a least squared line or a regression line. Those are kind of all terms that are used relatively interchangeably. Um, but so if you see any of these, they all mean the same thing, okay? It's the, it's the best prediction that we have. All right. So it says, demo. Sorry. All right, so I was gonna show, I'm just trying to, we only have five minutes left. So I have a nonlinear regression that we can kind of show, um, but I don't think I'm gonna show it because we don't really have time. Uh, I will figure out what I was screwed up about on the uh, minimize and talk about it next time. Um, but that's how we do linear regression as opposed to a nearest neighbor regression mechanism. Um, and I promise linear regression will be on the final because it's very, very useful, comes up all the time. It's a good thing to know. All right, but let's call it there.